just going to say, please join me in welcoming to the podium our speaker, Emily Rooney. First thing I'm going to have to do is move down the mic about eight feet. <laughs> <laughs> President Wilson, Chancellor Motley, distinguished guests and graduates, I would just like to start by saying that I'm so pleased to be here with these four other honorary doctorees, including the musician Steven Tyler, and I'm wondering why it is that I'm the one who has to sing for my supper. I also want to know if this doctorate is going to be good enough to get me into that Joe Kennedy, Joseph Abood commercial. And you know, I can strut across and say, just 05, Rooney. Is it going to be good enough? <laughs> Before I was asked to speak to you today, I was sitting around with a bunch of my colleagues who are roughly my age. We were all struggling to remember who our graduation speakers were. I eventually remembered mine. He was the outspoken FCC Commissioner, Nicholas von Hoffman. But then, I couldn't remember if my parents had attended my graduation. So I called my twin sister, who graduated with me from the same college, American University, 1972. She couldn't remember if our parents were there either. It was a different time. Our parents were not as involved in our lives as yours are and yours. My parents didn't worry about my grades or whether I would have health insurance after I graduated. They did not get on the horn and start calling their friends, asking them to give us job interviews. In fact, most of my friends weren't worried about making money. They either wanted to save the world or somehow avoid being drafted to serve in Vietnam. Things are different now, and I'd say mostly for the better. For one thing, my generation started worrying about money. Communication between young people and their parents is better, for that matter. Communications in general are a lot better. We all look at the world and see mostly the same things, even if we not, do not do the same things. As New York Times columnist Tom Friedman says in the title of his new book, the world is flat. We all have the same hopes and worries because the world is one unit now, a global economy, an awareness of the divisiveness of religious beliefs, an instantaneous communication system. Speaking to a recent graduating class, former NBC anchorman Tom Brokaw noted that, in many ways, you are not only the class of 2005, but also the class of 2001. When terror struck on September 11, 2001, most of you were just beginning your freshman year. I thought about how true Brokaw's statement was. My own daughter was a freshman at George Washington University in the fall of 2001. She called me in a panic as she watched smoke rise from the Pentagon. If she had never thought about domestic terror before, she did then. If she had never, never heard of Osama bin Laden, the Taliban, or could not find Afghanistan on a map, she took a crass course. It changed the direction of her life, and likely yours. You became aware of something. It's tradition in graduating, graduation speeches to offer advice, and here's mine. Maintain a general level of awareness as you go through life. Just as you are now clued into Osama bin Laden, clue into other things that are going around you in the world. I'm not saying you have to read a newspaper every day or catch the news on TV, although that wouldn't hurt. I'm saying absorb information and keep it with you. In recent weeks, most of you came to a judgment of your own about who you felt was most qualified for the position of chancellor of UMass. We all read in the papers that J. Keith Motley, your interim chancellor, while a long shot for the job, was the favorite among you, the students. Only a handful of people, mostly academics and news people, bothered to inform themselves about the other choices. But since the interest of your university was at stake, 
I hope all of you took the time to learn something about the other candidates. If you did, then you discovered that not every decision in life is black and white. There are shades of gray. If you tuned into this very important public debate, you were among the elite who were aware of what the choices were and how difficult that choice was for your president, Jack Wilson, and the board of trustees of your, of your university. I've read a lot of commencement speeches in recent weeks. My dad gave one, my dad is Andy Rooney, in case you didn't know, <laughs> at my daughter's graduation from, G, from George Washington. His was good. A lot of the ones I've read focus on the same thing, jobs. And while I know that is a concern for many of you, I'm gonna take a real leap here and presume that at some point, most of you are either gonna get one or you already have one. You'll use your own skills and abilities, your connections, your internships, your parents, friends, and professors, and eventually you will find something, maybe not exactly what you want at first, but something. So I'm here to tell you how to impress people around you once you land the job. And in keeping with my theme here, a lot of it has to do with staying on top of your game. I don't want to sound too much like Bill O'Reilly, but when he says, I know what employers want, and it is not people with nose rings and their underwear hanging out, he's right. I know one more thing about employer, employers also. They like people who know what's going on, who take an interest in the company, who have a positive attitude, who try to make things better and do not complain about what's wrong. I've been on both sides of the company aisle. For 25 years, I was an executive. Now, I'm the so-called talent. I can tell you this side is more fun, but I can also honestly say the other side had great rewards. As a manager, you are a team builder. You get credit for the success of a company, or in my case, a news organization. Of course, when things don't go so well, you also are the one who takes the blame. When I was an executive, I prided myself in being a problem solver. Now, I am the problem. <laughs> Taking on a new challenge and being unaware of the pinnacles and pitfalls that lie ahead is different from being naive. I took on an assignment in the early 1990s where I was both unaware of what was to come and naive about how difficult the assignment would be. I was named executive producer of World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, reporting directly to the legendary ABC News president, Rune Arledge. I was the first woman to ever hold the job, and more significantly, the first person ever to come directly from the ranks of local news to the top of the heap at a major television network. I was so important. So many people relied on me for daily decisions about what to cover. Do we dare send crews to Somalia where drug warlords were dragging the mutilated bodies of our servicemen through the streets of Mogadishu? Or should we stick to domestic affairs? The Ohio River Valley is flooded, displacing thousands of people, stranding remote farmers, their livestock perched on roofs. It was great video. At the time, I was unaware of the fact that I was the only one who thought I was getting the job done. I was fired and now bear the dubious distinction of being the executive producer with the shortest tenure in the history of the broadcast. <laughs> By the way, if anyone ever tries to tell you that being fired is character building, I'm here to tell you it is not. <laughs> to my credit, I never blamed anyone for what happened. I didn't even troll out the old, they never would have done this to a man excuse. After a few months of healing a severely bruised ego, I looked back on that experience with a great deal of appreciation, not for being fired, I hated that, but for what I learned, for how much more aware of the world I was. I became familiar with the countries of Africa, their leaders and their forms of government. I came to understand the historical tensions in the Balkans, Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, Kosovo, I was privileged to travel to Russia to see firsthand the end of communism and the first small steps toward capitalism. I spent time in our nation's capital where I witnessed the complex do-si-do -si -do between politicians and journalists. 
I paid attention to our Supreme Court, making sure whenever asked I could reel off the names of the nine Supreme Court justices. I have to say I used a little trick. Three S's, a B, an R, and a K, two women, and an African American. Scalia, Souter, Stevens, Breyer, Rehnquist, Kennedy, O'Connor, Ginsburg, Thomas. I always got it. <laughs> I familiarized myself with pending cases. I knew the decisions were rendered in May and October. I figured out who sat on which side of the issues, and I often predicted the outcome. The law is not my area of expertise. Maybe it will be for some of you. If it is, make sure you know what's in the court of public opinion as well as the issue before you. I was talking to my twin sister, Martha, after my daughter's graduation and told her the theme of my address today was going to be maintain a general level of awareness. She jumped on that and said, just that week, there was an opening at the National Institutes of Health National Library of Medicine, where she works. They interviewed eight people for the job. Only one of those people could name the current head of NIH, Elias Zerhoui. And that same person was the only one who could name all five major divisions within the medical library. Guess who got the job? The woman had many of the same qualifications as the other candidates, but she bothered to find out something about the place where she wanted to work. The medical library staff determined that the young woman was with it. She was generally aware, and this was an important aspect of the position. I realize there are a lot of things in life I am not tuned into, but it doesn't mean I am not aware of them. I have never seen American Idol. I don't plan on seeing Return of the Sith. I don't particularly care for the music of the Ying Yang twins. I don't think Ali G is funny. I'm rooting for athlete Alex in next Saturday's Belmont Stakes. I know about these things not because they are important, but because it's important to keep up. For one thing, it makes you interesting. Better yet, there is nothing like having a command of the facts when you go to make your point. It makes you credible. It's instantly disarming, and it's so satisfying. I'm encouraged by the fact that so many young people, and I'm willing to bet most of you are among them, talk to their parents and to their parents' friends as peers. It's a direct line of communication where detailed information about stuff, some important, some not, is traded between generations. My guess is you know a lot more about Social Security than my generation ever did. Until now, that is. <laughs> That's because we're about to use it all up before you get there. It's up to you, by the way, to solve that problem. I started out today by saying it isn't really necessary to read a newspaper or watch or listen to a news broadcast, but I don't really mean that. I think it is. As of today, there is no more reliable source of information. I know my business has taken a beating in recent years with plagiarism, fabrications, and the use of unreliable sources. Deep throat, not among them. But I can tell you this, it's a whole lot more reliable than the wild west of the internet, the rumor mill, and even more reliable, if you can believe this, than Jon Stewart. When I graduated from college, I saw a lot of my friends <laughs> and classmates for the last time. That will happen to many of you today, too. But there's a big difference. Remember, the world is flat now. You will keep in touch through emails, instant messaging, Facebook, people finder, and ways that have not yet been developed. Maybe one of you will invent that new way to keep in touch. And when you do reach out to touch that someone who will, be, who will intersect with your life in a way that you can now not predict, they will want to know something that you know about an expertise you've developed, maybe a medical cure you've discovered, or a legal precedent you've set, or the standards you've established for your business executives. And that someone reaching out to you is going to make one big presumption. They're going to assume you know what you're talking about, that you are generally aware of what's going on in both your business and around the world. I'm confident you won't let them down. Thank you.